So we've talked about strokes now. We've talked about them in a fair bit of detail. We've talked about the difference between essentially middle cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery and upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Uh, and we talked about dividing our clinical assessment of somebody into forehead, face, and body. Now I want to talk about something that I mentioned in the beginning again of this lecture, way back when, that not all hemiplegia is due to CVA. There are other causes as well, and there's one other major cause that I want you to be aware of, and it's called Bell's palsy. And Bell's palsy um, presents in a way that could fool you into thinking that the patient is having a stroke, but they're actually not. So here's what to look for. Imagine that you go see a patient, and because you're you know, being thorough, you do your facial neuro exam, and you see that on one side, pick a side, left side, they've got a lack of forehead wrinkling, they've got a wide and palpable fissure, they've got a weak eye squeeze, flattened nasolabial fold, <clears throat> deviated tongue protrusion, and an unequal smile. And you think, I remember Mark's thing. This is both uh, upper and lower face. It's got to be a stroke. But then, because you're a conscientious paramedic, you keep on going and you ask about dizziness, diplopia, dysphagia, uh, dysarthria, all the other um, upper sort of parts of that physical exam. <clears throat> and you do the PETS test and test their body and you realize there's nothing wrong with any of that. The only thing that they seem to be having is isolated unilateral facial weakness. What's with that? Well, that is what we call Bell's palsy. And Bell's palsy is something that you might see uh, out in the field. Well, you probably will if you see a lot of patients. And it's due to a weakness of the facial nerve. So we have uh, 12 nerves that exit. I'm not going to get into cranial nerves, but we get 12 nerves that exit right from the brain. Um, so it makes them very useful to assess clinically. And the seventh one is called the facial nerve. And this is actually an infection of the nerve itself. So we think it's usually from herpes simplex. It develops kind of slowly because it's an infection. So it's not a fairly sudden onset like you'd get from a stroke with a, with a you know, big bleed or a blockage to the artery. It develops instead of over minutes, it develops over hours to sometimes days. It's worse at about three weeks. We treat it with steroids and antivirals. And they get a, a usually recover. Um, so after about six months, people are pretty much okay again. Um, but the median onset happens in older people, about 40 years old. And if you take a look, I got a picture here of a guy who you may or may not know. Any Canadian of a certain age will recognize him. This is Jean Chrétien. And Chrétien was uh, our prime minister for a while, hence the Canadian flag and the little Canadian poppy. And because he's a liberal, he's got a red tie. But if you take a look at Christian's face, you can see a lot of really interesting things. So uh, take a look at the palpable fissure. You see that he's uh, wider a little bit here. He's got a good nasolabial fold, but he's lacking a nasolabial fold here. And he's uh, got obvious weakness to the right side of the face. So he's got right-sided Bell's palsy. And he's uh, unfortunately didn't recover entirely from the condition. So this is uh, chronic now with him. He'll be like this for the rest of his life. And that's an example of Bell's palsy. So what's happening in Bell's palsy? Well, if we take a look at uh, back to our you know, fundamental wiring diagram, here's that whole diagram of the, of the body laid out again. What happens in Bell's palsy? Well, in Bell's palsy, you actually get um, a lesion down here in the facial nerve, so the lower part as it's coming out towards the face. So it's not up here with like a lower motor neuron, it's down here where we're getting into the facial nerve, and that ends up giving us um, hemiplegia to one side of the face, upper and lower ipsilateral, one side of the face. It's not a problem in the brain itself at all, it's a problem with the neuron that comes out of the brain. And that's when we see uh, Bell's palsy. But there's no somatic signs at all. The body is okay. It's strictly isolated to motor control of the face. There's no confusion, no speech problems, anything like that. It's just that facial exam. They fail it on there. 
So, boy, lots of information. Let's summarize that. The one, the first thing that we'll start with, there are three major presentations. We're going to take a look at middle cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, and then Bell's palsy. So the first one is our classic middle cerebral artery cerebrovascular accident that happens about 70% of the time. So what do we get? We get the CVA on one side of the body. We get forehead sparing. And on the contralateral side of the face, we get uh, the facial uh, symptomology. And then we get the same side of the face, but opposite sides of the lesion, we get body problems. So if you read through there, I don't have to read it, um, you'll see how it works out. Uh, one of the things that I stumbled over earlier is this. The tongue protrudes away from the side of the lesion. So if the lesion is here on this side of the face, if we've got a um, right-sided lesion, the tongue will deviate to the left. It'll devi deviate to the same side as the weakness of the body. That's our presentation number one. Presentation number two is in the posterior circulation. So it's the same side of the face. There's no forehead sparing. So it's the upper and lower face both have hemiplegia. <clears throat> the tongue protrudes towards the side of the lesion. So the tongue always protrudes to the side of the weakness. That's the way to remember it. And in posterior circulation, the weakness happens to be on the same side as the lesion in the brain, but then we get these crossed findings, the crossed sign of the other side of the body being affected. And the last thing we're going to take a look at is Bell's palsy. And in Bell's palsy, we get the same presentation as a brainstem stroke. So question for you, which way would the tongue deviate? It would deviate to the same side here, go out to the right side of the face. But there's none of the problems with speech production or anything like that. <laughs> and there's no problems, there's no weakness in the body. So when you get an isolated cranial nerve 7 uh, infection, you just get the face with no body involvement. Right? So there's no CVA here. This is just palsy on one side. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's put it all together and do some case presentations. The first is you get a 70-year-old man who's presenting with a sudden onset of weakness and slurred speech. That's probably what your dispatcher would give you. On examination... The patient's able to wrinkle his forehead bilaterally. The palpable fissure is, uh, palpable fissures and eye squeeze is equal bilaterally. Typo there, sorry. So upper forehead is okay. The left nasal label fold is flat. He has an unequal smile, so there's a weak on the left, and his tongue deviates to the right. He's got dysarthria, dysphagia, left-sided pronator drift. What's going on with this guy? Well, if we break it down as we did here, with the forehead, face, and body. Let's take a look at the forehead and face. The forehead spared. So the upper half of the face is still strong. The face, however, is weak. So the left half of the face is weak, and that is suggesting an upper motor neuron. So he's got a cortical lesion. Got problems with uh, his body on the same side as the face. So what we've got here is a classic MCA CV. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's try case number two. 45-year-old woman, overnight onset of facial weakness. Overnight. On examination, patient's unable to wrinkle her left forehead. The palpable fissure and eye clean strength is weak on the left. Left nasal label fold. Um, tongue deviation to the left. Unable to smile. But no dysarthria, no dysphagia. Pronator drift isn't evident. Forehead, face, but not the body, and the same side of the forehead and the same side of the face, and prolonged onset over hours. So what we're looking at here is probably Bell's palsy. And you can take a look at why. So we've got evidence of lower motor neuron lesion, but it's not a cortical lesion because there's forehead sparing. Um, so it's either Bell's palsy or it's a brainstem CVA. And when we go down here, there's no other signs of somatic involvement, so that's got to be Bell's palsy. Let's do case three. 41-year-old male presents with sudden onset of loss of balance. <clears throat> On examination, patient is unable to wrinkle his left forehead, so he's weak left forehead, weak left face, and 
dysarthria, dysphagia, can't move the right arm or the right leg. So upper and lower face and contralateral body. And when we think about how that works out, upper and lower face is brain stem, not a cortex. Uh, so that's either brain stem, or so it's either, yeah, brain stem CVA or Bell's palsy. He's got weakness in his body, and since the facial nerve doesn't innervate the rest of your body, it just innervates your face, that means it's more than just the facial nerve. So this has got to be a brain stem CVA. So those three are the three basic cases that we can look at. Let's do something else for fun. For each of the following, state whether it's due to an upper lesion, lower lesion, both, or neither. So if we have somebody with one half of the forehead wrinkle is weak, or if we have another patient where the entire forehead wrinkle is uh, strong, or if we have someone where the entire forehead wrinkle, left and right, is going to be weak. There's a bit of a trick question in here. <clears throat> so if one half of the forehead is weak, that's a lower motor neuron. If the entire thing is strong, it's got to be upper because our bilateral innervation will protect it. And if the entire forehead, left and right, is weak, it means that, this is the trick question, it means that your middle cerebral artery and your posterior cerebral artery are blocked. So basically your entire circle of Willis is blocked and the left and right cortex of your brain are dying. And that's an injury so massive that it's pretty much incompatible with life. So if your entire forehead wrinkle is weak, it's uh, in this case, because you're dead. <laughs> so just to get you thinking a little bit about it, obviously that's not terribly realistic, but it just gives you a little bit of, of um, a challenge to think about how the anatomy and the physiology work. That's a big one. There's a lot of information in that. Um, you may be a little bit confused about parts. Go over the, the talk and make sure you're building up each level of the pyramid properly. So you got to know where the primary motor cortex is. You got to know what blood vessels perfuse the different parts of the motor cortex. You got to know the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons, and you got to know the facial nerve. And if you understand that bit about the wiring, then you can understand how the upper uh, and lower motor neurons manifest clinically. Make sure you understand how to assess the upper face, how to assess the lower face, how to assess uh, the body. And if you've got all of those building blocks in place, then you should be able to uh, understand all of this and be able to put it together. But it's going to take practice. It's going to take a lot of thinking about this and making sure that you get it clear. There's a picture that I put into the slide presentation just before I think the Bell's palsy, and it's the total wiring diagram of how the brain connects with the body. Obviously, there's more than that, but in terms of hemiplegia, that's all we're worried about for now. So make sure you can reproduce that diagram and that you have uh, that mental template in your head so that you can start to pick in what goes wrong in various different areas. Leave a question in the comments. I do monitor the comments from these talks. So if you have a question, I'm happy to answer them when I have a chance because I'm busy. I teach and I got a PhD and going and all sorts of stuff. But generally, if I can, I'll get to them. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it.